I said, Lord, did you, uh, were you pleased with me? He said to me, how are you going to make disciples? Isn't that what he commissioned us to do? Make disciples of all nations. So, hey, you gonna make disciples? I said, I'm not sure. He said, Well, what does disciple mean to you? What's well, obvious? You teach somebody about Jesus, right? He said, No, that's not a disciple. He said, are you teaching the men how to discipline their life? I said, yeah, I'm doing that. He said, that's disciple. Discipline. You got it? It's not teaching people about Jesus because half the stuff they teach, it doesn't mean anything. But if you want to teach people about Jesus, every single one of us has a flawed background. And where did that flaw come from? for the most part. Lack of discipline. You weren't disciplined. You stand and believe in God, you wait for two weeks and then you quit. That's not discipline. What do I teach you? You stand until you win. Well, what if it takes 10 years? What if it takes 17? Is the fruit going to be just as sweet? It's going to be sweeter. You know, the Bible says, he that reaches the greatest depth of sin will love me the most. And as I look back in my life, I got pretty raunchy. But I see people in my life, they're all goody goodies. Most of them never even got baptized with the Holy Ghost. They're just kind of goody goodies. They just kind of always kind of did what seemed right. I'm going to teach you tonight about faithful Abraham. Because it's not about following the law. If that's what you're doing, you're wasting your time. And that's what most preachers beat their people up with, the law. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And Jesus says, if you will focus on the thou shalt, and the vision of being a believer, then thou shalt not aren't even in play anymore. You won't even think about it because that's been handled at the cross. All sin has. God wants us to walk in faith. God wants us to do what Abraham did. The Bible says he didn't follow after the law. You know why Abraham didn't follow after the law? Mark wasn't here yet. The law doesn't come till Moses. And he's many hundred years later. Abraham was the first 
Jewish person. And when Moses got to Egypt, there's four million of them. There's no law yet. So those people that beat the daylights out of you over the Ten Commandments and the law and all that, you just walk away. Walk away. Because all you're going to do is you're going to get under condemnation. And the minute you get under condemnation and the minute you start judging yourself in a sense of condemning yourself, I'm not talking about judging yourself and saying, okay, I, I can see you can go that way or you can go this way. I choose this way. Okay? I'm talking about condemning yourself to a place where I know so many people have gone to church and they gave up because they couldn't get there. I couldn't be good enough. I was trying to follow the law. I just can't get there. And Jesus said, that's where you made your first mistake. Because our pattern is faithful Abraham, whose faith was accounted to him as righteousness. Do you understand? It's not a matter how good you are. Not a matter how perfect you are in keeping the law. It matters what you believe. Do you believe the Word of God? Do you believe the promises of God? That's what's important. Not keeping a law. Not thou shalt not. You do this, you're going to be condemned. And what your mom and dad used to tell you, you know what your mom and your parents told you? You do that, and you're going to get in big trouble. You're going to be, you know, you're going to have this problem, you're going to have that problem. Well, they prophesied it. It wasn't that it would have happened. It's that they were prophesying it with their tongue. Do you understand? Do you get the difference? It wasn't that what you were doing was going to get you in that trouble. It's that the parents were prophesying it over you. Or your friends. Or somebody. The preacher. God's not interested in that. He's interested and you're becoming his family, being his son, being a part of that, and let him love you as a son, as a father loves a son, and quit trying to follow some rule or regulation and start following the promise. If your daddy told you he's going to buy you a baseball bat, don't run around the neighborhood saying, my dad lies and he ain't ever going to do nothing and that ain't going to happen. You didn't do that when you were kids, I hope. Let me ask you something. Can any of you think of something good your parents did for you? I want you to ask something. I'm going to sing you a song, so don't leave. You better not. Shout, you better not pout, you better not cry. I'm telling you why Santa Claus is coming to town. He's making a list. He's checking it twice. He's going to find out if you've been naughty or nice. Santa Claus is coming to town. Did you guys ever get anything at Christmas time? Did your parents give it to you because you were good enough? That song's from the devil. Well, I'll find out if you're being good enough. And Jesus has never blessed you because you're good enough. He blesses you because you're a son. Even your ungodly or unrighteous or not loving parents, if you have that. Maybe some of you had the other way. But even those parents will buy you things and buy you shoes 
and put a shirt on your back and buy you pants. And not one of you deserves it. And yet we get into church and the first thing we think about is how good we got to be or we're never going to get nothing from God. That isn't the word of all. I had to learn that. I, I had my times of condemnation. I had my times of struggle. Talked to my farmer this past week. Said, your beans are ready to take off. I said, they are? He said, yeah. I said, they, they're, really, they're really bad. You have not gotten any rain. And the farmer that farmed the field diagonally from my field used a, a herbicide that it should be banned in the state of Ohio, but they still use it and he uses it because it's cheaper. And so it does when it falls on his plants, the wind comes along and blows it over to your plants and it can kill your plants. And he said, and that's what happened. He said, all that herbicide blew over into your field. He said, I'm hoping we get 40 bushel an acre. Okay. And he said, but there's a 20 cent premium if you take them in right away. Just kind of wanted to call you and tell you that. No, the devil had him call because he's a thief that wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He didn't know that. He wasn't against me in any way, shape, or form. But how many times have I said, you got to pay attention to what you're listening to? And that just got dumped on me, just like, boom. So I was, I was at the, my farm, and I'm driving back. You guys will, don't know who I am. You guys come to the hog roast, and you'll see where I live. And the time by and by, you know how I got what I got and how God blessed me. And keeps blessing. He never stops. What we stop is our receiving. Because he can't give it to you if you're not looking for it. Because he says without faith it's impossible to please him. So God wants us to believe him. He wants us to believe him like he's our dad. I never questioned my mom and dad whether I was going to get a pair of shoes, a pair of blue jeans, and a couple shirts to start my school year. Never questioned it. I always knew I was going to get I know I was only going to be taken care of. I was going to have food on the table. Never even thought about it. It's just always there. How about God? Where's he at? This being that gave his life for you so he can live inside you. That's why I did it. Because he said, unless I die, I cannot live inside of you in the form of the Holy Spirit. How about this guy? This God? You got, are you conscious of him? So I'm driving down 81. And I come to my field, and the Holy Spirit said, pull in. So I pulled in, pulled up to my field, got out of my truck, walked over to my beans. And I'm quoting scripture. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have. For whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou plucked up and cast in the sea, and do not doubt in his heart, but believe the things he says will come to pass. You'll have whatever he says. I said, I'm going to have 55 bushel an acre out of this field in the name of Jesus. And God, you can do exceedingly abundantly above anything I can ask or think, according to the power that's working in me right now. Power of my tongue.
Got back in my truck, drove back to the office. That was Friday afternoon. Got a call from the farmer Saturday morning, this is past Saturday. He's telling me about this and this and this. I said, Glenn, how we do? He said, well, it's a miracle. I said, what? We got 58 bushels an acre. There's no, I, I don't know how we did that. I don't know how we got that. So, okay, appreciate it. Thank you. Do you believe that? Believe you can do that? Why? Why? Why can you do that? If you're born again, you have the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, don't go do anything until you are endued with power from on high. That's getting filled with the Holy Spirit. And I am. That's a pretty big difference. 52 acres. You want the devil to seal from you? You want to destroy? You want to kill your vision, kill your dream, kill your hope? Maybe even kill you. And if not, You've got to be on God's side. You've got to stand. And after you've done all you can do, you stand. Because you're going to be tested for one reason. God ain't doing it. The world's doing it. The devil's doing it. You know why? Because he's allowed to do it. To see if you believe what you say you believe. He's allowed to do that. He can test you all the time. Nothing to do with God, nothing to do with the law. He might beat you up with the law. Well, the reason that didn't work is because you're not good enough. <laughs> if, you follow, if you were following the Ten Commandments like you should, you would probably have got that. But that isn't what the Word says. Constantly reminding us that we're not good enough. And that's what the devil does. Because if he gets you convinced that you're not good enough, you aren't going to receive. Because you're not looking for it anymore. That's how it works. This, this is not tricky dicky stuff. It's not playing games. This is dealing with the creator of the universe, not the world, not the politics, not the business people, not the banks, not all the other stuff that looks like it's, of the, you know, important. I haven't used the bank for 30 years. I do anything I want to do. Never paid a house mortgage in my whole life. Because I believe, not because I felt I was good enough. When I stayed focused on the Word and I kept believing what the Word said, I didn't think about the law. I didn't think about thou shalt not. I didn't even have that on my mind. I didn't think I was good enough. I was so focused on what God promised me. Sir, if you promise me this, I can take that to the bank. If you promise it to me, then I just need to implement it. If you don't implement it, if you don't go put seed in the ground, you're not going to have a harvest. It's not going to happen. You have to implement his promises. Those are seeds. They have life in them. 
I know that just it seems like it's just ink on a paper or words in a, on a tongue, but they have life in it because it changes your heart. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And all the issues of life come out of the heart. All. We're talking about the seven different steps of what we must do to understand about our warfare. First one was the church, which is his body, does not know who they are. First of all, you need to know who you are. Second is it takes childlike faith and a willingness to be disciplined and listen and don't get in pride. And oh, no, Doyle, he said that to me and he said that to me. Well, you know, he wasn't very nice, you know. I'm not into the emotions here, guys. You want to get into the emotions, go home and talk to your wife. You can do it there. But it ain't coming here. Emotions never get anywhere. And I know that's going to offend some folks. And it's okay, because I don't care. <laughs> I'm trying to just grow up some men to be disciples. Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes you got to hear some things you just don't like. Sometimes you get kicked in the teeth and sometimes you get kicked in the rear end and sometimes you get knocked down and sometimes you get beat up and sometimes you just get a situation where you just get mad and you just don't like it. But you know what? Get your feelings off your sleeve, grow up, get over it, and get on with changing. I don't say things to you because I don't like you. I say things to you because I got to grow you up. And that's not a simple thing to do. I got 20 men here that, that all have a different world you came from. Every one of you. But if you get into the word, I can pretty well identify every one of you somehow in the word. And even though maybe your parents had a different name, the, the principles were still the same. The stuff you learned were still the same. And it was all boiled down to doubt and unbelief. It all boils down to ignorance. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. But God says you don't have to be that way. So I'm not going to stand up here and try and hold your hand. That ain't going to fix nothing. All it's going to do is make you spoiled. And I don't want to have any spoiled kids. So I spank and I discipline and I speak the word. That's what it does. It'll discipline you because you're going to have to, you may be mad at me, but you got to deal with what was said. And that ain't me. Number three. Never is there a time that there is a separation of the body and the head. Crisis ahead, you're the body. There's never a time when those are separate. Okay? Got to know that if you're going to do warfare. Number four, it is our role and our responsibility to know what is ours. If you don't know what's yours, you're never going to take it. You're never going to claim it. Why did the nation Israel mark it, walk into the promised land? To get themselves killed? They walked into the promised land to take it. Why? Because they knew that it was theirs. You know, God promises amazing things. The wealth, do you know what the Bible says? The wealth of the sinners laid up for the just. I just did a posting. I don't know when it's coming out. I'm written about four days ahead. But sometime in between now and Tuesday, I did a little teaching about some principles. Talked about Bill Gates. You know he has money, right? One of the wealthiest men in America. But does he have peace? 
Does he have joy? You want to have money and not have peace and joy? You got it wrong. And you got the cart in front of the horse. And you know what happens when you get the cart in front of the horse? They both fall in the ditch. God wants you to have the peace and the joy. He wants you to have faith. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to have the things that you have. I look back on my life, fellas, and I cannot think of one single thing that I have, whether it's this building, the buildings next door, the building, other places that I have buildings and other things that we own. I can't, I can't think of one single thing that I got that I wasn't stepping out in faith, that I could not see how I'm going to make this work, but it did because I stepped out. Not one single thing. Some of you got to see me build this building and how I worked this out. It was a, it was a faith venture. I started designing it. And the lady that I was designing a portion of this for Mark, you, Mark was involved. I suppose we worked for eight months, back and forth, talking to her. Guess what happened? And I believe in God for all that's in me. Everything, I, everything around me was wrong. Everything around me wasn't working. Everything around me was falling apart. This lady and her husband of... 40 years or 35 years. He got mad because he wanted to move to Carolinas and she wanted to stay here and yada, 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 yada. Next thing you know, they're going through a divorce. And I'm in the middle of it. What in the world am I doing here, God? You know how many times I've gone to God and said, Dave, any Christmas, God, can you make something easy for me? You know what God does when I say that? He's silent. He acts like I do. I said, I don't care. You can come and talk to me all you want, but I'm not interested. That's what he does to me. I'm just not interested in that. So he just goes, he just goes quiet. You know what he waits for? Me to go to my Bible and start reading and start listening to what he's saying. And I'll read and I'll read and I'll read. Next thing you know, he'll talk to me. And he would show me that that thing I was doing and talking about was stupid. So why would you want me to answer a fool? He says, don't ever answer a fool in their folly. Got it? That's why I don't care. Because most of the stuff that people challenge me with is foolish. Had a lady call me this afternoon. She was trying to tell me something about some business person. And oh, you all take consideration of this. I said, look, look, I'm not interested in hearing any of this. Don't want to tell you the whole story, but I just said, look, I'm not interested in telling them. Oh, she said, I don't want you to get offended. I said, I'm not offended. I'm just not going to listen. She's off on something. That, and I said, I don't have time for this. And she got talking. I said, look, I don't care. And I'm going to go because I'm busy. And she was a Christian. But that's, isn't that the banner that everybody comes to? Well, I'm a Christian. And, you know, he's a Christian, so you can trust him. Or he's a Christian, you can do business with them. The Christians I built for, phew. I had some bad experiences with them. They tried to cheat me, tried to lie to me. But you know what? I just said, I don't care. You know why I say I don't care? Because I don't want to be a part of their foolishness. That's what God meant when he said, you never answer a fool in their folly, because the minute you do, you become a part of theirs. Got it? Somebody would have come to me and said, well, how stupid is that? Did you believe in for that? Well, you know why? Because they can't get it, right? How would you believe for changing your soybeans? How, how would you do that? I'm talking about Christians, Mennonites, people who all know about God. 
That's why I don't talk about it. Because I haven't got time to mess with it. So I just do it, and I keep it to my heart. I hide it in my heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart. I didn't hide it in their heart. I don't know where they're at. If you read the scriptures the way that I'm reading it, you can almost doubt whether they're even believers. Because they don't believe God for nothing. They believe that he died on the cross and going to go to heaven someday. That's not how Abraham seen it. We're going to talk about it a little bit. Okay, those are the four points that we've covered. Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. It says, study to show yourself approved. King James. A workman need not be ashamed, right? right, right. What's the Amplified says, study, be eager, do your utmost to present yourself to God. This is the Amplified. Be approved, be tested by fire and trial. A workman that has no cause to be ashamed. For the word of truth, the word of truth means correctly analyzing, accurately dividing, rightly handling, and skillfully teaching. The word of truth. That's what 2 Timothy 15 says in the Amplified. You know what's significant about all that? What did I miss? Second Timothy 15 is not a good suggestion. It's a command. He doesn't say, I think it's a good idea if you spend a little time in the Bible and spend a little time reading and spend a little time studying or coming and listening to somebody that has something to say. Uh, just, you know, just once in a while. He doesn't say it that way. He says, you study, you study, you study. That's a command, if you know English at all. That's not a suggestion. That's what was missing in what I said. You do it. Why would God say that? Because he don't like you? Why would I say it? Because I don't like you? Why does God say that? Because he loves you, and he knows what it takes to set your feet on high ground. He knows what it takes to change where you were, to go to where you should be. He knows what it takes. And he gives us those precious and magnificent promises in his word to get you there. That's the only way you can get there. You're never going to change what you were if you don't know what to change to. Now, you can go to uh, some education class or go to some university or go to whatever you want to go to and listen to all the garbage they have to say. Or you can just sit in your home and grab this little book here and take a little time to read it. And you'll find out where you're supposed to go to. You'll find out where you were and where you're supposed to be. Where you are not supposed to be and where you should be, and where you're going to be. The faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, and faith will get you there. Nothing else. Do you think you're going to make it another way? We'll just look at your past. What are you going to do that's different? Going to keep doing it? You know what? If you're 30 years old, you'll be 60, and you'll still be the same place you are. Maybe farther back. Number five. 
how to understand about our warfare. Number five, get to understand who you are in Christ by gaining knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because God don't like them. Is that what it says? People are destroyed for lack of knowledge because Steve don't like you. Get up and get going. Take back everything the devil has stolen from you. This is what you ought to look at your past for. Not to define where you're going to be, but to tell you that you can get it all back. You know that the devil was your enemy, and he's the reason why you're there. Don't blame your mom and dad. They were just ignorant. Don't blame your friends. You were ignorant. You blame the devil, because he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Yeah, we have responsibility, but our responsibility is to get on God's side. Find out what God has to say about something and hang your hat on it. Bet your life on it. That's what Jesus did. Oh, you know, oh, Jesus, he knew about the Father. He had the flesh just like you do. You understand? He had the same doubts, the same struggles, and it says in the Bible that he has not been tempted. You have not been tempted any more than he ever got tempted. He had the same temptations because he had the flesh to deal with. How I feel, what it looks like, what it tastes like, what I hear, and what people say. He had that to fight with all the time. Remember when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane? Talk to the Lord, hanging on the cross. He said, oh God, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Do you think he was saying that from the Spirit? Saying that from his flesh. He was warring. He was warring. And it says he sweat great drops of blood because he was warring against what his flesh was screaming and what he knew the Spirit was saying. The same thing going on in your life. But he was without sin. He never doubted. And that's a real goal. Not following the Ten Commandments. But don't doubt. Because if you doubt, you're not in faith. And faith is the key. Do you understand? Faith is. Not the law. You got to put the devil in his place. And Ephesians 4.27 says, don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. Don't do it. Don't let him cause you to doubt what you felt the Lord say to you and what you're stepping out and believing him for by faith. The key is find something to do by faith and do it, even if it's little. even if it's small. Because God said we go from faith to faith. And everything in the kingdom is little by little. God doesn't want you to take a bigger step than you're able to handle, but he does want you to take a step. He does want you to step forward. And as he does things for you, then your steps should get bigger and bigger, and bigger. But don't start there. I want to read you a little bit about Ephesians. It takes faith and courage to know that Ephesians 1 is a real and true and not just empty words. 
Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. It says that Paul was an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And this is addressed to the faithful in Christ Jesus. It says, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father. Verse 3, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Did I say he has? It doesn't say here he's going to. He has blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. So you were chosen before the world was created. Do you know that? You were in God's heart and you were in his mind. And when he created you, he had a plan for you. A plan to bless you. A plan to prosper you. Not to harm you. Not to cause any hardship. Not to deal with the stuff you've had to deal with most of your life. That wasn't God's plan. But those are over. And I told you, those that reach the greatest depths of sin will love him the most because they recognize how much they've been forgiven for. So if you've reached the great depths of sin, rejoice. Because you have the capacity to love the Lord more. Be in a better place than the whitewashed folk. Whatever you've done, man, it's erased. It's not there anymore. You know what's there? God's book of remembrance of you and his plan for your life. Unfortunately, we spend 30, 40 years working to retire. And then when we retire, we want to go somewhere and just hang it up and do whatever. And we're not not even looking for God's plan. And they go to church every day for 35 years, 40 years, 50 years. Not have a clue what they're doing. And they're just doing what the world says. Franklin Delano Roosevelt come up with retirement. God didn't come up with it. You can't find it in the Bible. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be frugal of saving, should be be wise in the handling of money. We've got all kinds of examples of that. When Jesus was dealing, or when the man was dealing with the, the caretaker, he gave two talents, five talents, and ten talents. And the one that got the two talents said, man, I was afraid of you, man. I just, I don't want to lose this, so I was afraid. I thought, man, you'd really reprimand me if I lose this. Guess what happened? He got reprimanded because he didn't try to lose it. And he took it away from him and gave it to the guys that had five and ten. Because the guy that had five and ten put their life on the line. They took a risk with somebody else's money and they multiplied it. Five times, they doubled it. What are you doing with your talent? Is it buried? You're going to be reprimanded for it someday because you want to know why you did that. I want you to step out in faith because remember, this is all about faith. This is not about law. He didn't say to that guy with two talents, did you cuss? Did you lust after some woman? Did you hate somebody? Did you honor your father and your mother? Did you kill somebody? He didn't say any of these things. He said, you're a foolish servant. Take what he has. Take it away from him. Stick him in the lake of fire. Nothing about the law. It was about the faith. He was not 
willing to take a step of faith because he's afraid of losing. That's why you don't do it. You're afraid of losing. Your life don't even belong to you anyways. Neither does the money you have. You're just a steward. That's all. You're a steward of everything you got, everything you accumulate. I had some cash that we're not using in my companies. And I mean, the Lord jumped all over me about that. You know what? It's in, it's in the bank. Do you know what the bank does with your money? They invest it. Oh, my gosh. They invest your money? Guess how much they pay you? This much. Guess what the inflation rate is? This much. 8%. One year goes by, your $100 is now worth 92. Simple math, simple economics. I called up the bank. So this is a bunch of hooey. I can't believe you're not giving me anything. Oh, Mr. Doyle, we'll work that out. I said, what are you going to do? Well, we'll start paying you 3%. I said, that's not good enough. So I'm up to five and a half. I said, that's not good enough. I don't believe that's good enough. Might for a temporary basis. We got to get serious about this thing. All the world out there is just sucked into all the stuff that the politics are doing and the world is doing and then, you know, and everybody, oh, we're all going to retire. We got to retire. We got to do this. And, and, and it's all about me and all about myself and what I can keep for me and what I can do to bless me and what I can do to help me and maybe my kids and me, us four, no more. You know, that's not what God's principles are for. Christ has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. How do you get holy? What did we just get done talking about? How do you get holy? Be good enough? How do you get holy? Are you born again? Are you born again? You born again? You guys born again? You're holy. You may not act like it, but you are. You're holy. If you have the Holy Spirit, you're endued with power from on high. You may never act like it. You may never use it, but you have it. And God's going to judge you for that. He's not going to judge you whether you lied or cheated. That's all taken care of under the blood. But he is going to talk to you about what he gave you to do and whether or not you used it. This is what he will talk to you about. It's called the judgment of the believers. I hear a lot of monkey business about that. Don't want to get into that now. Got too much to cover, but listen. Verse 5, Ephesians 1. You have been predestined to the adoption by Jesus Christ according to His good pleasure and His will. You were predestined. You are, if you have accepted Jesus, you have fulfilled that predestination. God has chosen you from the beginning of time to be born again. You are his child. You're not trying to be. You're not good enough. 
You just are. Because He did it. He made you His child. The minute you said, I want you to come and live in my heart. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He grabbed the hold of your life. Said, now let's do something big. Let's fulfill everything that I have planned for you. You know, I don't feel like I'm anything. I mean, I never mounted nothing in high school, and I never mounted anything when I was a kid, and everybody said I was a bum, and everybody said I was no good, and I was worthless, and everybody says you'll never go anywhere in life, and you'll always be failing at everything you do, and you, you know what? There's nothing in your life that anybody would be, have any interest in copying, or, and nobody cares about you at all. Do you think God would say that? You just thought, well, you said that. No, the Bible says you have an enemy. His name is Satan. And he doesn't like you. And he lies to you. He'll do anything he can to steal your life. To take it from you. Because you have to give it to him. You understand? He can't come to you and take it away from you. You have to give it to him. And the only way that you can combat that is by faith. And say, the Bible says, and by faith, that's what I believe. And that's when it works. Because when you resist the devil, he has to flee. Not a choice. It's a command. God watches over his word to perform it. He makes sure that that will work when you resist him. But you can't resist him if you're ignorant. I'm not talking about stupid. There ain't none of you stupid. But ignorance is a different thing. Ignorance means lack of knowledge. That's all. Do you guys know how to put a rocket ship in space? You guys know how to do that? then you're ignorant. Of putting a rocket ship in space. But there's a lot of stuff that you know. And God says, I want you to get it out. And let's start using it. If you were in a war and people start walking down your driveway and they had guns in their hand and you had a gun in the house, would you walk out there and try and reason with them? What would you do? No evil will befall me, neither will I plague come down my dwelling, for God gives his angels charge over me to keep me in all my ways, and they'll be of me up, lest I dice my foot against the sun. You know, a thousand fall at my side and ten thousand on my right hand, it will not come down my dwelling. Get the guns, baby. Why? Because the angels will help you. They're not going to do it. They will help you. Because the Bible says angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who are heirs of salvation. They're your ministering spirits and they're there to help you. The Holy Spirit is called paraclete. It means one sin alongside to help. They're not there to do it. They're there to help you. You have to do it. You have to step out in faith. You have to believe. You have to put your feet forward and go get something done for the kingdom. You have to do it. And they're there to help you. They energize your hands and they energize your feet and they energize your brain. They'll give you plans and ideas, direction. But you got to do something or they have nothing to work with. You understand? <clears throat> The Bible says he has made us accepted 
in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his glory. Why would you be looking at the law if it says you are redeemed? Why would you be looking at the law if it says you have redemption? According to the riches of his grace, not yours. You're already forgiven. The day you got born again, it was over. You got garbage coming back to your brain? It's because you didn't renew your mind to who you were. And the devil's going to take your ignorance and twist your brain till it does something real crazy. Or you can get into the Word and let that direct your traffic. Decide whether you're going to turn on the stoplight or not. That's your choice. You can say, devil, the light's red. Stop your machine. I got the green light. And I ain't turning it red. I have control, not you. God gave it to me, not him. Christ has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. That means you have it. It's already there. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's already there. Wisdom and knowledge and understanding and righteousness and redemption. It's already in you. You can walk out of here and just think you're going to hell all the rest of your life. But you don't have to because it's all a lie. And it's time to quit believing the lie because the devil's a liar. Jesus is not. He's the way, the truth, and life. He, the devil is a liar. Comes to kill, steal, and destroy. You don't ever have to have any of that crap in your life anymore. When you see it, stand against it until you win. It cannot come nigh your dwelling unless you open the door. He has made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And you have him inside of you. For you have attained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. You have obtained, you have been predestined. You, if you've accepted Jesus, your predestiny has been fulfilled. And Christ is in you, the hope of glory. What was one of the seven steps? You never separate the head, Jesus, from the body, you. Never. He'll never leave you and never forsake you. He'll be with you even until the end of the earth. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, being saved from everything that has been a problem to you your whole life. You have been saved from all of it. None of it has to have an effect on you anymore. You start walking in this word, you start walking in this truth, you walk right out of it. You rock right out of the mess, the crap, the garbage. And don't let it come back in your house. Keep the rattlesnakes out of your house. Don't accept the bag when they knock on your door. Just tell them, take it to the neighbor. It's not coming nigh my dwelling. That's a mindset. Do you understand what discipleship is? I am disciplining you to get this in your mind so that you are strong in mind to resist the devil. That's why he wants you to renew your mind and prove that which is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He wants you to know 
What you have, you, you, you've inherited the kingdom. Church, go out there and start taking it. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. Go out and start taking it. It's what I do every day. I'm looking for it. I'm believing it. In whom you also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You're sealed. He's never going to leave you, and he's never going to forsake you. If you will believe God, we're not going to get into that tonight, but that's how Abraham said it. His faith was accounted to him as righteousness, not keeping the law. We'll talk about it next week, a little farther. His faith was accounted to him as righteousness. What you step out and believe God for is accounted to you as your righteousness. And we're going to see some pretty interesting stuff next week. Oh, by the way, I won't be here next week. Soon. Listen, this is the earnest of your inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. You are already in Christ. You have all the power you're ever going to get. You'll never get more. When the baby is born, he had, do you know he has all the muscles he's ever going to get? You know what people think? Well, yeah, I, I, that's not muscle. There's 200 muscles in your body, and the baby has all those muscles. You're not going to get any more. You might develop those muscles, but you're never going to get more. Do you understand? You're never going to get more. You may let them get flabby and weak as you get older, but you're never going to get more muscles. You have everything you need to be victorious in the kingdom of God. Everything. You just need to start developing it and learn how to deal with it. Like speaking to a bean field. I worked dumbbells a long time to get that one. Listen to me. One more thought. God does not waste his time saying things he does not mean, nor intend to back up with all the powers of heaven. That is what it will take to bring us the power and the victory in this life to accomplish all that he wants and we desire and pray for in all earnestness. God doesn't mess around. He calls a horse a horse. He doesn't call a male a female and a female a male. He doesn't call a donkey a goat. And doesn't call one of his sons lost. Do you understand? You're not lost. You just need to get some direction and put your feet to it. And stay with it till you win. So draw your sword and prepare for battle. Because the spiritual world is greater than the physical world. And this is the promises that I teach. I'm not talking about physical things. That's the world. I'm talking about greater things. And he said, even greater things will you do because I go to the Father.
We ain't seen people raised from the dead yet, but we should be. We haven't seen a lady with an issue of blood get dried up, but we should be. We haven't seen all kinds of miracles, but we should be. Because these signs follow those who believe. They lay hands on the sick. They recover. This is what we got to believe. Are you practicing? That's how you do it. You practice. You'll be sensitive to the Lord. Every place you go, you're sensitive. Whether you're buying your gasoline to help maybe somebody else, you're buying groceries to help somebody else, or whether you're walking through some place and you see people that are crippled or in wheelchairs, it doesn't matter. Are you willing to be embarrassed? Then you aren't willing to give yourself. What's your life worth anyways? So why get worry about being embarrassed? Your life is only valuable if you're obedient to the Father and do what he directs you to do. He's never going to condemn you. He's never going to beat you up. But therein lies blessings. And what greater testimony can you have than that believe God for something, see it come to pass, and you're able to tell people about what God did and what you did because it took you. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you. I believe that I receive, that I have distributed this word in a manner that's pleasing to you. I believe it. I receive it, sir. If there's anything in there, it was me just clean it up. That's not my intention. I give you thanks for it, Father. I give you thanks for the opportunity. Father, I thank you for the hearers. Because unless we're hearers, we deceive ourselves. And then we be doers of the word. And that's how it works. Sir, as we take your communion here tonight, I pray we be cognizant of your blood and your body the price that you paid so that we can be redeemed, wise, full of the Holy Spirit and power and be enjoy full redemption in your kingdom here on earth. And we give you praise and thanks for it, sir. In Jesus' name, amen.